Welcome to Thursday Theology. We are continuing through Wayne Grudem's book, Christian Beliefs, 20 Basics That Every Christian Should Know. Uh, last week, we looked at the first half of chapter two, uh, which was called, What is God Like? And I mentioned that this is by far the largest uh, or the longest chapter of the book, obviously, as it's going through the doctrine of God and the various attributes of God. Uh, there's so much that could be said about God. And so we went over uh, 12 attributes of God last week, and we're going to look at 12 more attributes of God this week. So we will get right into it. Okay, so moving on to the 13th attribute. Uh, we see that God is love. And we see that love is who God is. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it says, God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. John chapter 17, verse 24, this is Jesus praying to God the Father. He says, Father, you loved me before the foundation of of the world and so love first and foremost it is God's character uh, it is uh, who he is uh, it represents his heart but secondly love is not only who God is love is what God does I think most of you if not all of you know this most famous verse John chapter 3 verse 16 where it says for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life romans chapter 5 verse 8 god shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners christ died for us and also first john chapter 4 verse 10 in this is love not that we have loved god but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins so there are many nuances to the word love and some of you know that uh, God's love in the original language is called agape, which is not just a brotherly love, um, but it is a sacrificial love. The closest definition of agape love is the love of uh, a parent to a child. It is one that is shown through action. It is shown through sacrifice. It is shown through giving. And so we see that God shows his love um, he demonstrates his love by the giving of his son and it is ultimately the giving of his son to take upon the punishment for our sins on the cross and so love is what god's people also reflect it's not only what god does it is what god's people do so in matthew chapter 22 verse 39 it says you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the second greatest commandment. Uh, John chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And 1 John three sixteen uh, says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So just as we have received love, we also want to reflect love. Uh, we want to be like a mirror, uh, just as his love has you know, shined on us, we want to shine his love onto others as well. Uh, and I think a good way to remember that is, you know, John 3.16 talks about God's love for us, and then we see that first John 3.16 is talking about how we, in turn, give our, our love to others as well because he has laid down his life for us. And so love is what God's people reflect. 14, God is holy. Uh, what is holiness? Holiness, it is purity. It is moral purity. Psalm 99 verse 9, it says, The Lord our God is holy. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. There is none holy like the Lord. So God, he is perfect. He is morally 
pure. Uh, holiness, it's also separation from sin. So purity, it's uh, cleanliness. And in order for you to stay completely pure, you must be separate from what is unclean, and that is ultimately sin. And so this is described in uh, Leviticus chapter 20, uh, verse 25. It says, you shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean and the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or anything with which the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. Verse 26, you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. And so holiness, um, it is demonstrated through the separation of what is uh, seen as unclean, what is seen as sin. And so this was uh, described in the Old Testament through many physical uh, objects or beings in the New Testament, uh, there are still many things that are deemed sinful and immoral. And we, as God's people, are called to be uh, separate from sin. Uh, holiness is described wherever God is. And we see in the book of Exodus that the ground that God was uh, located in, it was called holy ground. Uh, it says God's majesty, uh, it's holy. Uh, it talks about his holy dwelling, a holy Sabbath to the Lord, a holy mountain where God dwells, and a most holy place in the tabernacle that only the high priest could enter once a year. So wherever God is, uh, that place was considered holy because of God's presence. And God, he also pursues our holiness. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10 says he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3 it says for this is the will of god your sanctification which is the process of us growing in holiness uh, becoming more like god and so uh, holiness it is um, the most repeated attribute of god and it's also the most emphasized attribute of God and uh, God he longs for us as his people um, to reflect that character uh, that attribute uh, which uh, is often emphasized in his word 15 God is righteous and just so God is the standard of what is right that's what it means that he is righteous Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4 all his ways are justice a God of faithfulness and without iniquity just and upright is he Genesis chapter 18 verse 25 shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just and so God defines the standard of what is right that's what it means that uh, he is righteous and just and so because God declares what is right and wrong. God must punish uh, that which is wrong, which is sin. And so Colossians chapter 3, verse 25, it says, For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. However, God chooses to forgive some because God is gracious and merciful. God chooses to forgive some. God is able to forgive people. Because Christ took God's punishment for their sin upon himself on the cross. Romans chapter 3 verse 25 and 26. It says, this was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time. So that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So... God in forgiveness, he doesn't just sweep sin under the rug, uh, but he still punishes sin. God always punishes every sin. Uh, the only question is, do we take that punishment or does Christ take that punishment? And God 
offers us forgiveness when we acknowledge that Jesus has taken the punishment for our sin. 16, God is jealous. Uh, now, this sounds like a very uh, interesting attribute. How can God be jealous? Uh, what does it mean that God is jealous? It means that God seeks soul worship, honor, and praise. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, uh, as God is giving the Ten Commandments, he says, I, the Lord, am a jealous God. Uh, later in Exodus, verse chapter 3, 34 verse 14 says you shall worship no other god for the lord whose name is jealous is a jealous god now what does it not mean that god is jealous again it sounds strange that god is jealous uh, well it does not mean that god is insecure uh, god's jealousy it is perfect um, our jealousy our human jealousy it's imperfect. Uh, we are jealous because we are uh, insecure. Uh, for example, if uh, my wife were to be attracted to a male celebrity, I might be jealous. Why? Because I'm insecure. Um, and he may have greater attributes than me. However, God's jealousy, uh, it's perfect. Uh, God is not insecure about uh, anyone having greater attributes than himself. Rather, it is the fact that God cannot stand for his people to settle for less than the best. And he knows that he is the best. So jealousy is an expression of God's love. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 it says, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. And so uh, God's jealousy for us, it doesn't come from a place of insecurity. Uh, it actually comes from a place of wanting to give us the very best, which is himself. God cannot stand for his people to settle for less than best any other idols any other gods any other fleeting pleasure that will make us more empty and more dry god wants us to be quenched uh, with the living water that only he can provide 17 god is wrathful towards sin what does it mean that god is wrathful towards sin it means that god hates all sin again god is holy and he is completely separate from sin. And so he cannot tolerate sin. God hates all sin. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now why should we thank God for his wrath towards sin? We should actually thank and praise God for his wrath towards sin because it means that God will avenge all evil, all sin, all injustice. Romans chapter 12, verse 19, it says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9 says, You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Now, we don't like to think of an angry God, but if we did not have an angry God, then there would be so much evil, sin, and injustice that would go unpunished. Uh, but praise God that he is actually a God of wrath, uh, that he does not allow evil, sin, and injustice to just be swept under the rug. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, there will be judgment and God will have vengeance on all sin. Now, number 18, God wills what he will. Uh, what does this mean? It means that God has a sovereign desire that cannot be stopped. He has a purpose. He has a plan. 
uh, that cannot be halted. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Romans 8, 28. And, for, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And so God, he has a purpose even before the foundation of this world, even before all of creation, God had a purpose and a plan, a sovereign desire, and it cannot be stopped. God will do what he will do. Now, God's will, it actually allows for both blessing, but even suffering as well for believers or even unbelievers and that's the reality of god's will that it's not only blessing uh, but it even allows for suffering ephesians chapter 1 uh, verses 3 to 4 says blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us in christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now, wouldn't it be great if this were the only um, will that God has for us, that we would be blessed um, with every spiritual blessing. Uh, but the reality is that God also wills that we suffer. First Peter chapter 3, verse 17, it says, For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will. And so uh, the reality is that God allows for suffering, even for uh, his people. Um, now, if God wills all things, is God responsible for sin? You know, we, we see in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, that he predestined all things, that Everything that he purposes, it will happen. So is God responsible for sin? Well, in the Bible, human beings and sinful angels, otherwise known as demons, are always blamed for sin. So no, God is not responsible for sin. Human beings and sinful angels, demons, are responsible for sin. Uh, Job chapter 1, verse 12 says, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And we know that Satan was allowed by God to cause Job to suffer. And so ever since the fall of mankind, ever since the very first sin, when Adam and Eve first rebelled against God, all of us are always prone to sin and so god doesn't make us sin uh, we are compelled to sin uh, in our hearts and it is actually god's will that allows us not to sin because he gives us a greater desire uh, a desire that is stronger than sin it is a desire for himself and god chooses uh, people to choose him even more than sin and so god is not responsible for sin although god allows uh, suffering and god allows people to sin uh, wayne grudem he says this he says the exact relationship between his will and evil is not something he has chosen to completely reveal to us and so we're never going to fully understand how God is sovereign and at the same time how we are responsible. We're not going to completely uh, understand that uh, with our um, limitedness, with our uh, finiteness, uh, this side of heaven. Um, but we must trust that although we are responsible for our sin, that God in his grace and mercy he has caused us to have a greater desire than our sin. And so praise be to God that he has uh, offered us a way to, to seek him and to respond to his grace. Number 19, God has freedom 
What does it mean that God has freedom? It means that God is not under any authority to dictate what he should do, what he should or will do. And so it means that God, he is the highest authority, that God is free to do uh, what he wants. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does as all that he pleases. So nothing can hinder God from doing his will. He is not constrained by anything outside of himself. He is completely free to do whatever he wants to do. Now, having said that, what does it not mean that God has freedom? It does not mean that God can do anything outside of his character. So, for example, God cannot sin because God is holy. He cannot sin. So he's not free to sin because that is outside of his character. So God cannot lie. God cannot be tempted with evil. God cannot deny himself. Uh, some people make the silly hypothesis, uh, can God make a rock so big that he cannot lift it up? No, God cannot make a rock so big that he cannot lift up because that would be outside of his character. And so God, he is free to do whatever he wants, but the only uh, constraint is being true to himself. God cannot sin. God cannot lie. Uh, God cannot deny himself. Uh, 20, God is omnipotent. What does this mean? It means that God is all powerful. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says, He is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. So God's power is infinite. God is able to do anything um, that He wants, again, within His character. Uh, it means that God works miracles. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. So that means that God can do what man cannot do. That's what makes God God. That what, that's what makes us not God. Uh, God can do all things. Now, what does it not mean that God is omnipotent? It does not mean that God's power is merely physical or political. Now, when we think about a powerful God, we might think of uh, God from Exodus uh, doing all of these uh, plagues and, and miracles, uh, showing uh, his power through nature. And although he can do that, uh, we see uh, also in the New Testament that his power is not just physical, but it's also spiritual in nature. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. 1 Corinthians 2, 4, My speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know, nowadays, some people might think that God doesn't demonstrate any power. We don't see these visible miracles, uh, these visible manifestations anymore, but uh, we see that God's power, uh, it is often spiritual in nature. The fact that someone uh, can be changed uh, through his word, it shows the power of God. And so uh, God is omnipotent. God can work miracles. God can do far more abundantly than we can even ask or imagine. Uh, but oftentimes it is not manifested physically, but it is manifested and demonstrated spiritually through a changed life, through someone growing uh, in holiness more like God. Uh, 21, God is perfect. What does it mean that God is perfect? It means that God never makes a mistake. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, it says, Your heavenly Father is perfect. Luke 23, verse 4, I find no fault in this man. This is Pontius Pilate talking about Jesus. Jesus was blameless. Um, God the Father, he is perfect uh, in all of his ways. 
Now, if God is perfect, why does the Bible say that he regretted? How can he have regrets? For example, in Genesis chapter 6, when it talks about um, the people on this earth before the flood, it says that they continually did evil. They only did wickedness all, all the days. And then it mentions that God regretted that he even created mankind. What does it mean that God regrets if he is perfect, if he never makes a mistake? Well, when used of God, regret, it incorporates the thought of compassionate grief and an action taken. And so uh, re when it says God regretted, it doesn't mean that God made a mistake. Uh, but as I mentioned last week, it's anthropomorphism, where God, he is almost described like a human being. Although God does not have... Um, a body uh, like a human body he is described as a person and so even regret falls into that category so God was not showing weakness admitting an error or regretting a mistake rather he is expressing his desire to take specific drastic action to counteract the wickedness of mankind so even when it says that God regretted uh, in creating mankind, uh, he's not admitting that he made a mistake. He is showing compassionate grief for the people that he has created. And he is uh, making a drastic action to counteract the wickedness, the sinfulness of mankind. 22, God is blessed. What does it mean that God is blessed? It means that God fully delights in himself and in all that reflects his character. So God, he is utterly God-centered. God delights in himself uh, and namely through the, uh, the Godhead, the Trinity. And so God, he did not create the world or mankind because he was, um, because he was lonely. Uh, God, he had perfect fellowship in the Trinity, and each person of the Trinity is other-centered. And so the Father is Son-centered and Spirit-centered, the Son is Father-centered and Spirit-centered, and the Spirit is Father and Son-centered. So all three persons of the Godhead, the Trinity, they all glorify one another. And so God was not... Uh, lonely um, he had perfect fellowship within himself however God still chose to create us why did God create the world and mankind God chose to delight in his creation so in Genesis chapter 1 uh, through all the days of creation it says that God saw that it was good and then on the sixth day after he created mankind it says behold it was very good and so God, he did not need us, but he chose to delight in us, in the creation of the world and ultimately through mankind. And God desires for creation to delight in him. So he delights in us, but he delights when we delight in him. Uh, Pastor John Piper, he says this, he says, God is the one being in the universe for whom self-exaltation is not the act of a needy ego, but an act of infinite giving. The reason God seeks our praise is not because he won't be fully God until he gets it, but that we won't be happy until we give it. So us as human beings, because we are created in the image of God, we will not be fully happy until we give God glory, until we give him praise, that is actually when we get the most delight. And at the same time, that's when God gets the most delight. And so because God is the greatest satisfaction uh, and everything else is settling for less, uh, he um, actually wants us to be most happy when we give him glory, when we find joy and delight, satisfaction in him.
23, God is beautiful. What does it mean that God is beautiful? It means that God is the greatest satisfaction of our souls. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Psalm 16, 11. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so God, he is the greatest satisfaction of our souls again because we are created in his image uh, we were made to worship him he is the only one uh, that can eternally uh, satisfy us now what sin does is sin it distorts our vision of beauty and so we look at things in creation, we look at things in the world, and we think that so many things in the world are beautiful. And many things in creation are beautiful. But what sin does is that it elevates the beauty of the world to a much higher place than it should be, and it also devalues the beauty of God. And so we think that the created things of the world are utmost beauty and we think that the beauty of God is less than it is that's what sin does it deceives us it distorts our vision and so we can see it in the way we live we worship whatever we think is beautiful and so I want to ask you what pulls your eyes what pulls your thoughts what pulls your time and your attention whatever uh, that is uh, whoever that is uh, that's who you think is beautiful. That's what you think is beautiful. And that is ultimately what you worship. All people are worshipers, whether they are religious or not. All people are worshipers. And we worship whatever we give our eyes, our thoughts, our time, and our attention to. Whatever pulls um, our hearts, whatever uh, entices us. Whatever we think is beautiful, that is what we ultimately worship. We are giving of ourselves to that thing. And so repentance for us as believers is a reorientation of our vision. When we see that the things that we think are so beautiful in the world, we realize that they are just merely created things. There is beauty in the world, but they're not what is ultimately beautiful and when we see that God, he is um, the most beautiful thing of all, that is when uh, we experience true repentance. When we see that it is not just, um, worship is not something that we just have to do. It's something that we get to do because God is so beautiful. He is the greatest um, desire of our hearts. And so... Um, yeah, that's what we long for, that we would continue to reset our eyes, that we would reorient our vision to see how beautiful God is. And then lastly, we see that God is a unity. Uh, what does it mean that God is a unity? It means that God is all his attributes. We just went over uh, so many attributes of God um, today and, and last week, and Although some of God's attributes may seem to be emphasized more than others, for example, God's holiness, it is the most emphasized attribute of God, still God is unified in all his attributes. So he is not more of one attribute than another. He is not divided into parts, and he is not one attribute at one point in history and another attribute at another time. A lot of people like to say that God is a God of wrath in the Old Testament and God is a God of love and grace in the New Testament. No, that's not the case. God is a God of wrath in the Old Testament. God is a God of love and grace and mercy in the Old Testament. Also in the New Testament, God is a God of grace and love, but we also see that God is a God of wrath in the New Testament. As it says in Romans uh, chapter one, as it says in book of revelation so god is 
all of his attributes at all points of time in history. Scripture never singles out one of God's attributes as more important than the rest. Even though God's holiness is the most emphasized, um, it's not the most important. They are all equally important because they are all a part of God's character. Each of God's attributes represents an aspect of his character. So uh, they each provide us with a perspective on who he is and who he has made us to be. And so as we have gone through uh, so many attributes of God, um, I hope for you that um, what you have gotten out of this is not just more information about who God is, although it is good to know uh, more about God. I hope that all of these attributes have deepened uh, your appreciation of who God is, that you are able to see God as beautiful, not just someone who is to be feared, not just someone who is to be obeyed, but someone who you desire to worship, someone who you want to glorify. And so uh, as we come to a close uh, with chapter two, um, I'll close us in prayer at this time. Father, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to delve into uh, the very uh, many attributes of your character. God, we see that you are a God of holiness. You are a God of righteousness and justice. You are a God of wrath towards sin. But you are also a God of grace. You are a God of mercy. You are a God of omniscience and omnipotence. You are a God uh, of love. You are a God um, who has made a covenant with us, chosen us uh, in Christ even before the foundation of the world. And so as we um, have studied uh, the many characteristics of your being, uh, we pray that you would not only increase our knowledge uh, but we pray that you would increase our affections for you, uh, that we would see you as uh, most beautiful, that we would see you as most satisfying. And so uh, we pray that you would continue to humble us, uh, make us deeper worshipers of you because you are worthy of our praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.